Welcome to the Lorraine Baptist Church. It's good to see your faces, folks. It's good. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. We've got uh, something important happening this week. Friday night, the social servants are meeting, right, at 6.30 in the fellowship hall. And if you haven't seen the fellowship hall lately, woo-wee, it's looking good inside there. And they're going to have their February meeting. It's going to be soup, right, soups. So people will be bringing different kinds of soups, and there'll be crackers and all the other stuff. Um, and they are having a pounding. They're collecting items for the Lorray Girls Home. Lorray Girls Home Day will be next month, sometime in March. That hasn't been nailed down exactly. One of the last two Sundays of March. But also on that Sunday, on that Lorray Girls Home Sunday, will be our first attempt to have high attendance Sunday this year, right? High attendance, so that on that there'll be some other people here. So you just have to work, just work a little harder. When we get a hundred people in the room in the facility that day, that Sunday morning, then off comes the beard. <laughs> now I know some of you don't want to, but don't let that keep you from staying home. Don't make don't make that stay, make you stay at home or not bring someone because we do want high attendance. Amen. So the, if that one doesn't work, we'll have some other plans later in the year, and, and hopefully by summertime at least, maybe I'll, I'll get some of this off. But if not, you're just going to have to live with it, right? So if you really want this off, you're going to have to bring a crowd. And our first attempt will be um, on Lorraine Girls Home Day. So we should already have some other people coming that day. So that, that's one thing that's coming up. So do remember, now I want to remind you that these, these uh, gatherings of the social servants are open to anyone, any age. Uh, one person, a couple, a family, any, everybody's invited to these things. So we hope that you will uh, come and participate in that if you have opportunity. We uh, are going to uh, be entering the season of, of Lent before long. And we'll be gathering on a Wednesday evening. What's the, what's the date of that? 22nd. 22nd. The 22nd of February on that Wednesday night at 6 p.m. for um, our Ash Wednesday service. And uh, most of you are familiar with that who have been part of this church for, for years now. But others of you who have never attended an Ash Wednesday service. It's a very powerful, very meaningful service as we reflect on you know, our lives, our purpose in this world, and, and the time that we have in it uh, to bear witness of Christ and to carry his cross um, as we live in the world. So I want to encourage you to come to that, and that will be at 6 p.m. on that Wednesday. Our call to worship uh, this morning is from a 19th century French prayer. Of course, it's been translated into English for us this morning. Please join me in this call to worship. We are gathered together to worship the God who has called us to love God. And the God who has asked us to follow God's direction. We are invited to worship God in the spirit of truth. We do so because, because we know the spirit and the spirit knows us. We are reminded that we are not alone. Because the Holy Spirit is among us, Jesus is with God, and God is present. Let us rejoice that because he lives, we too live.
our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. These are words of Moses as he was saying his farewell discourse, farewell words to the Israelites as he would stay on the mountain and they would go down into the promised land. See, he says, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you certainly will be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the words of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. Let us prepare then for prayer.
On Wednesday nights, we are praying the Psalms. We're learning how to use the Psalms in our prayer life. And we practice that on Wednesday evenings as we study these Psalms. And recently, um, in the study of the Psalms, we came across some verses that reminded us um, how to rest at night. We wake up during the night for whatever reasons, and it's hard maybe for us to go back to sleep. And so, uh, understand, I'm not trying to put you to sleep this morning, okay? <laughs> but we, we do know that when we wake up like that and we're having trouble resting, if we focus on God and what God has done for us, and how God has helped meet our needs in our lives and has directed us in our lives, then we, it's easier for us to rest. The other night I woke up and I could tell my blood pressure was up. Uh, honestly, I had eaten um, too much salt, too much sodium that day. And when that happens, um, I, can just, I can feel my blood pressure has risen. And indeed, when I went downstairs to check it, it was up high. So I just practiced um, what he had prayed before uh, that evening. And my blood pressure went down over a few minutes, down 20 points. Um, so, as we come together in God's house, we have many distractions. We have things on our minds that are worrying us. We may have uh, phones in our pockets. I don't. I leave mine in my office usually during worship. But we may have our phones in our pockets and they may uh, vibrate a little bit. Hopefully you've turned off, turned them off. Everybody turned them off when you come in so we don't have a ring in. I kind of miss Wilma sometimes because Wilma would just answer the phone. I'm at church right now. <laughs> Didn't you love Wilma? I just yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody knew, you know, what was going on. And she'd hang up and they'd call her back. I told you I'm at church. Well, let's, let's take this opportunity to quiet our minds. Ask the Holy Spirit to come into our minds and give us peace in these very stressful days. Well, God, each of us has many personal concerns and things that trouble us and hurt us Places where we have failed to live up to your high commands. But Lord, you are gracious. You are forgiving God. You move us to do better. We've gathered here on this day to recall your commandments and understand the choice that has been placed before us, life or death. And the goodness you want to give us if we will only turn to you through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This morning we pray for our communities and the families who live here. We pray, Lord, for those terrible things that are going on around the world, whether it be because of man's stubbornness and, and harmful feelings towards one another through war, or whether it be, Lord, natural occurrences of the earthquake that have killed so many. In all these things, Lord, we pray that as your people and through our efforts and through our gifts, that your, your goodness and your truth will live on through us and that as people see our lives as a reflection of yours, they will come to know you they will come to feel your power, they will feel your Holy Spirit, and that they too will be empowered to do great things in your name. And as we rest, Lord, this morning, give us strength for the journey and power for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is... Um, Actually, it's not a hymn. Yeah, it's a hymn. It's Psalms. <laughs> Psalms 119, 1 through 8. I'll be reading this, Psalms. Um, again, we have blessings. 
Remember a couple of weeks ago we had the blessings that Jesus gave us um, in the Beatitudes. Here are two blessings. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. These are the words of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. Now there's another hymn. There's a wilderness in God's mercy. The title of my uh, sermon today is, Please Just Stop. Now, it's based on this passage that I'm about to read from Matthew's Gospel. But Jesus is not so nice. You won't find the word please. Okay? You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Racha, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, 
If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand causes you to stumble, excuse me, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife and gives her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but to fulfill, fulfill the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven or for God's throne or by the earth, for it is a footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I think I, I skipped over verse 30. Let me go back and read that one. Did I skip over that one? And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your whole body than for your whole body to go to hell. I just want to make sure I got all the hells in there, okay? <laughs> now, when you look down at my lesson titles, it's much gentler, okay? Please, please, just stop. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
while we wait for everybody to make their way to their seats, let's get a poll. Eagles? Chiefs? Huh? Yeah, it looks like, looks like the Eagles win. But, but I wouldn't bet money on it. Okay, it's um, Super Bowl Sunday. You ever notice uh, when you um, watch a football game, there are rules you got to follow, right? And if you don't follow the rules, what happens? You get penalized. Well, there are rules in living that God handed down through Moses and that Jesus then came as God's son in, in flesh and blood and made sure that the people understood those rules correctly and, and laid them down for us. And it seems sometimes that Jesus' rules were even tougher than that as those found in the Old Testament. I like to use quotes and um, of, of famous people and I know sometimes I quote myself, but, but I'm not a famous person at all. But see if you can uh, figure out who this one is. I do the very best I know how. The very best I can. And I mean to keep doing so until the end. If the end brings me out all right, what is said against me won't amount to anything. If the end brings me out wrong, ten angels swearing I was right would, uh, would not make a difference. Anybody got a guess? Abraham Lincoln. That was Abraham Lincoln's statement. Today we continue... Uh, to look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And it's a challenging thing, it is, Jesus' Sermon. It, it uh, kind of shakes us up. So much so that some scholars who study the Bible uh, kind of make up their mind that it's not for something for us living today, but something in uh, some time out in the future, after Jesus comes. But... I don't read it that way. I don't, my Bible doesn't say that. I believe Jesus is using this, um, this type of teaching method called hyperbole. You ever heard of that word before? Can you say that, hyperbole? Sometimes people mispronounce it like I did uh, wideness as wilderness, as hy hyperbole. But it's hyperbole. Jesus uses this teaching method to shock his listeners. To shake them up. To help them understand and think about what they're doing. Please just stop. Two weeks ago we looked at the Beatitudes. We found that there are more than blessings. That they are challenges and promises. And last week, we talked about sight, uh, salt and light, and the importance of, of our being that, those true elements in the world. That we should not, salt is, is more like red hot chili pepper, you remember? And last week, the text also demanded that our righteousness, our goodness, our our rightness before God, our justice in the world should go beyond that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who lived their lives every way possible that they could to be perfectly righteous and correct before God. Tried to do everything right. The Apostle Paul, he said by the law that he followed, he was perfect by the law. But he was the worst sinner of all. The law, Paul says, will not save you. 
Just following the commands will not save you. It's only by the grace of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, that saves us. Now look at these radical words. They seem radical to us in the 21st century, but more so in the first century. Anger, insults, cursing, all these things would lead you to Gehenna. Now Gehenna was a place outside of Israel, outside of, excuse me, outside of Jerusalem. It was a place, it was a garbage dump, dump where there was an, an eternal fire going on. Our Bibles translate it sometimes as hell. There's a different word for, uh, for hell as well, and that was Hades, the place of, of the dead. But Jesus here uses the word Gehenna, reminding us that there is penalty. There are consequences for breaking the rules, breaking the commandments of God. And our righteousness should not be something that we put on, like we put on a suit or a coat and a tie to come to church, to be righteous before others, but it's something that we have daily, that we live out in our faith every day, in our personal relationships, in our marriage, in the way we treat one another, even if there's a divorce, and even as we go to court. Now, what made Jesus' rules different from that of the Old Testament was that the cause of divorce in the Old Testament was always because of a woman. It was the woman's fault. It was because, and in the Old Testament, I mean, the laws, that, that how they were interpreted, that a, a man could dismiss his wife without cause, just because he didn't like her anymore. All he had to do was say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and give you a piece of paper, and she was homeless. Had no place to go. Had, had no, no rights, no, uh, no wealth, nothing from the marriage. Well, notice what Jesus does. He puts the responsibility not on the woman, but on the man. He says that, um, that you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully. Now who's going to be look, looking at a woman lustfully in the first century? Right? The man. He's pointing out the, man, the man's, the man's uh, lust as the commit of the sin. If your right eye, he says, causes you to stumble, then, then gouge it out and throw it away. Because it would be better to go into life blind than for your whole soul eternally to burn in hell in Gehenna. Right? Now those are shocking words for us, especially in our day and time. Imagine what they meant back then. Again, Jesus was using this teaching method called what? Hyperbole. He did this to shock the hearers. Especially those pious Pharisees and Sadducees who were dismissing their wives without cause. Leaving them homeless and without resources. But Jesus says, if you dismiss them for anything other than adultery, you are, you are messed up. You might as well gouge your eyeball out. Because what you're doing is you're lusting after another woman and not may remain faithful to your wife. It has been said that anyone who divorces his wife, give her a certificate, Jesus said. But... When you do that, man, you make her the victim of adultery. 
again when you, when, when you do that. So Jesus is shocking the hearers, even today, with these statements. But his point is not to pass judgment, to not give a sentence of death, to not tell you your life is hopeless, you're going to hell, because all sins are forgivable through the blood of the Lamb. All sins. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. The point he's trying to make is that we're all sinners. We all deserve the, the fires of Gehenna. We don't, want to hear, we don't want to believe that's true. We don't want to hear that, but we all deserve it. Not one. A very wealthy bachelor of 60 years told the ancient writer Voltaire that he was uh, in love with a much younger woman. But he thinks he has made a mistake by telling her um, that he was 50 years old, that he was young. And Voltaire said, on the contrary, you, have, you should have told her that you were 70. That way she knew she didn't have to put up with him very long, right? <laughs> Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, be honest. Be truthful. In all that you do, and don't swear by God or by your mother or anything else. Don't swear that you're going to do something. Let your integrity be your yes and your no. Let people know by the way you live your life that when you say yes, you mean it. And when you say no, you mean it. I never had to go to court and put my hand on the Bible and swear by it. Um, just because of this. And if the judge makes me do that, I'll probably tell him, I say, look, I'm a pastor. I try to live my life good. My yes means no, and my no, I mean, my, my yes means yes, and my no means no. See, I, see I'm falling too. We gotta live our lives in such a way that people know what we say is what we mean. Amen. A clean woman uh, had been converted to Christianity through the Salvation Army. And someone asked her what difference Jesus had made into her life. Now, I don't sweep the dirt under the carpet. Right? She actually cleans it up, throws it in the trash. It's affected the way she lives her life in everything that she does. People, when they see us as Christians, should know that we are different by how we live by how we treat, or treat one another. When the Lord grabbed me out of, of sin and called me to be a minister, it wasn't something that he told me. It was something that other people were telling me. I mean, finally he did after everybody else did. But they noticed a change in my life. They noticed something was different in my life. The, and the things that I said and the way that I treated people and the concern I had for others, they noticed my life was different. And they said, Kent, what's going on? And I'd tell, share with them what happened to me. They said, you ever thought about becoming a preacher, minister? I was like, no. Never thought of it. And then my church. People in my church I had known throughout my whole entire life they knew all the ugliness and the pain and my past. 
But suddenly, these people I admired and respected were now saying, Kent, have you thought about going to seminary? Have you thought about becoming a minister? And I said, no. Hadn't crossed my mind. Eventually, God would come and talk to me. But the point I'm trying to make today is that our lives have to change. We've got to stop doing those things that are destructive to ourselves and to each other. When we live that way, God can change the world through us. He can make things different. In 1928, the Church of England revised the wording of their communion service. And during the service, there is a phrase that's, that is lively faith. A lively faith. And they changed that to a living faith. Well, it uh, caused quite a stir in the church, you know, changing something like that that they're, that they're familiar with all the time, the, the minister saying. And one churchman in particular protested the change. He said, look at our vicar, your pastor. Look at our vicar. He's living, but he ain't lively. Now, I hope to the day I die, as a pastor, that when people look at me, they will say, not only is he living, but he's lively in his faith. Amen? Amen. And that's what I want to say about each of you. One day, maybe I, by the grace of God, will have lived long enough to be standing right here when you are having a service. When your service, memorial service, or your, your service before the Lord, um, your last time where we gather together. And, and I hope that I can look back on your life and say that person was not only living, but that person was lively in their faith. They had a genuine, real faith that wanted the best for others that loved the Lord and that gave their heart and soul to his work. Now some of you may not yet have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Some of you may have not take, taken that step to take his hand and accept him and to feel the goodness and the grace that becoming Jesus' friend what that means to you. We think we have friends. Some of us, if we've been brought up in good families, we'll look at our parents, our mother and our father, and we feel the genuine love that they have for us. Maybe you're a parent, and you look at that child, and you feel that genuine love that you have for that child. Well, the love that Jesus has for us, yes, even sinners, far exceeds the love that we have for our families. But we have to say yes to it, to feel its goodness and its grace and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to help Jesus to help him help others know that they love him. Because there's a world full of people out there who do not know of Jesus' love. Pray with me. Oh God, as we consider these commandments and rules, as Jesus has used his teaching method of hyperbole to shock us, we pray, Lord, that our lives will be different from this day forth. That whatever we have done, whatever we are doing, that is not building each of us up in grace and helping each other, our brothers and sisters in this world. 
Let us be transformed this day forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, speaking of lively faith, we're going to sing a song that I want us to be lively about. Revive us again. We need to be revived. Amen? Let's stand up together. Let's sing this song with energy and fullness and power. And let's feel his spirit. And if you have yet accepted Jesus Christ to be Lord, I'll be standing here in front before you. Please come. together oh God as we go forth from this day on this day that others call super Sunday let us be reminded Lord that this day is a day which we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus on this first day of the week now empower us with his spirit as we go into the world being revived in his spirit in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs>